reading from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Oh, may we heed his ancient words. Thank you. You may be seated. some stupid jerk's dorky feelings. And wouldn't you feel like an idiotic lame brain if you made some doofus into a crybaby because you called him a wimpy nerd? It's important that Christians are careful with the words we use so that geeky dweebs don't go crying to their mothers every time we open our mouths. Words have power, booger breath. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. Well, I, I hope you can laugh at that, and I hope you don't take that too seriously. But it does illustrate, I think, the impact, the influence that our words have in people's lives. In particular, how our words as Christians need to match up with what we say we believe. That old saying, you've probably heard it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? I don't know who coined that phrase, but that is the farthest thing from the truth. Every single one of us has been hurt by some cutting word that somebody has spoken to us. If you've lived for any amount of time, you have been hurt or you have been helped by someone's words. Because the opposite is true, right? You've all had words that have been spoken to you that have just lifted you up. I think of what Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Just that one right word, it just showcases. It's precious. It's a treasure to you. Well, last Sunday we began to examine this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. And this passage deals primarily with the area of our communication. Paul gives us four very effective rules for communication. And he demonstrates how Christians are to have a different perspective when it comes to our relationships with others. There is to now be a change in our heart. That means there to be now a change in our words. And these rules, I found, they are good for preventing problems, but they're also good for solving problems. And here's the thing. Good relationships are not built on the absence of problems, but by dealing with the problems in a way that pleases God. Now, really take note of that. Good relationships are not built on the absence of problems. They are built on dealing with problems in a way that pleases God. 
If we communicate God's way, then no matter the relationship, no matter the problem, we can resolve it for the benefit and the blessings of that relationship and for the glory of God. Well, last Sunday we examined just the first two rules of communication. And I know that many of you were not here, and I want to do something. I want to encourage you to actually this week to go and, and uh, listen to that message just online. It's 30 minutes, but it'll be well worth your time. And you'll get more in-depth of the first two rules. Now, I'm going to do a short little review, just so you're not totally out in left field and don't know what we're talking about. But I want to encourage you to go and listen to that message from last week. So the first rule that we looked at is that we need to be honest. We need to be honest. Verse 25, he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So the first thing we saw is that we need to speak. It's a command for us to do that. Now, implied in that is also that we need to listen. If you're speaking to somebody, that means somebody else is hearing you, right? Or if somebody's speaking to you, that means you're hearing. So implied in that is you also have to be a good listener. We talked about how we often listen not to actually understand what a person is saying. We listen simply so we can respond. We're too busy thinking ahead about how we're going to respond to what they're saying instead of actually listening to say, I want to understand what you're actually saying. But another implication of this is that people cannot read your mind. People cannot read your mind. And so unless you speak, unless you share that information, they won't know. We need to speak the truth, he says, to one another. So he says, be honest with each other. And honesty here, this is more than just not lying to somebody. It's actually sharing all the facts that are necessary to solving the problem. So if you tell the truth, but you leave something out, because, well, maybe it makes you look bad or something like that, well, you're not actually being honest. And then we saw that we need to speak the truth in love, as verse 15 tells us of chapter 4. And we tend to fall in one ditch or the other when it comes to this area of speaking the truth. There are those people who, they are really good at speaking the truth, aren't they? They will just tell it like it is. I'm just telling it like it is. But there's not a lot of love coming out of it, right? Their words are are not bringing life. They might be truthful, but they're not bringing life. But then there's the other side, the other ditch. And that's somebody that's, they're very loving, they're very kind, but they tend to not to actually say the hard things that they need to actually say. God says we need to do both. Speak the truth in love. The second thing we saw is this. We need to keep current. Verse 26. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So one of the first things we saw here, which... Is kind of mind-blowing if you think about it. Did you notice here, he says you are to be angry. He's actually commanding you to get angry. Now think about that. God is commanding you to be angry. Now when we normally think about anger, that's not what we think about, right? Well, I shouldn't get angry. Well, maybe you should get angry. Maybe the things you should get angry about. He says be angry, but do not what? Do not sin. The anger is simply an emotion. It's an energy that God wants us to use to solve problems. God is an angry God. But God does not sin. And his anger drives him to deal with the problems at hand. And the best example of that is what? It's the cross. He was angry with our sin. But let's be clear. God is angry with my sin. He is angry with your sin. He says he is angry with the wicked every single day. But his anger drives him to do something about it. His anger drove him to say, son, will you go and solve this problem? 
Will you give your life? And Jesus Christ said, yes, I will. I'll solve the problem of their sin that separates me from them. See, anger is sinful when it's used to attack others. When it's used to attack others. Or it's expressed in wrong ways. And part of the reason we have so much trouble with anger is because we've usually seen it done sinfully, right? So when we hear God is angry, we automatically go, well, I've seen that person who gets anger. I mean, I've, had, I've been on the end of that person's anger. And, and so we think, well, God must be like that. No, he's not. He uses it to solve problems. And so when, so when we don't communicate biblically and solve problems, he says, verse 27, the problem is we let Satan then have a foothold in our life. It's going to result in more problems. It's going to open the door, if you would, to more disappointment, to resentfulness, to bitterness, to hatred. And I put this in the context of marriage last week, and I think it bears repeating that so often, you know, by the time a couple comes for counseling, usually by that time, they're just so angry about things, but they really don't remember why they're angry anymore. They just know they don't like their spouse anymore, and they have hatred toward them. Part of the reason is because they violated this command. They've let things build up over time. They've swept it under the rug. They haven't kept current. They haven't kept up to date. They just keep letting it go on and on and on. And sometimes it's years of built up, and they haven't dealt with it. And so by the time they come to you, they're just sitting there in your, your office with their arms crossed and frowns on their faces, and I just I don't want to be with them anymore. Well, it's because they violated this. The problems begin to pile on top of each other when we don't keep current. So God says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. If you're mad with your spouse about something, if you're mad about something in your relationships, don't let it go on too long. And the principle here is deal with it quickly. Don't let a lot of time pass. Well, that's the first two rules of communication. The third rule is this. Attack the problem, not the person. Attack the problem, not the person. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the first thing he says for us to do, and we have to remember, this is in the context of Ephesians 4. He's giving a lot of instructions to a church here. And we have to go back to verse 22. We looked at that this last summer, and Pastor Todd just a couple weeks ago looked at this passage as well. He says we need to put off the old man and put on the new man. So there's things in verses 25 to 32 he's saying to us, okay, here's what this looks like. Here's the practical way you do this. Speak the truth, stop lying to one another, and now start speaking the truth. So here he says, okay, the first thing you need to do is stop your corrupt talk. King James calls it corrupt communication. Stop communicating corruptly. Now I have to think, well, what does that mean? Well, it means things like this, words that attack a person's character. You notice how soon, when we're dealing with problems, how very quickly we go to actually just name-calling? Just berating that person because we're so mad? That just simply clouds the issue, doesn't it? Me calling you a, you know, a stupid moron, that's why I started with that video, me calling you whatever names, and we know there's lots worse. How does that actually solve the problem? It doesn't, but that's what we do, right? We attack a person's character. We begin to tear down and rip apart who they are instead of looking at the problem. And all that does is cloud or bypass the real issues. And as an ultimate result, he says, it grieves the Holy Spirit. 
When you do that, you're bringing sorrow to your God's heart. Man, have you ever done that? I have, by the stupid words I've said. I've grieved my God's heart. So he says, put off that kind of talk. But he said, the second thing you need to do is you need to use the words that are edifying. Don't let that corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only good words that are good for building up. Verse 15, go back up there. It says, rather speak the truth than love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. This verse simply tells us there are two ways that we are to speak the truth. It is to be loving and it is to produce growth. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this. We are to look out for the interest of others, not only our own interests. And so we need to use words, he says, that edify, that build up, that give, notice verse 29, give grace to the hearer. You want to give grace to them. And that's the desire and ability to do God's will to those who will hear it. Make sure you use words that zero in on the conflict. They are solution-oriented. How is this, what I'm about to say, going to help the situation? Now, here's the thing. We can do this not only with our words, but we can do this with our tone. We can do this with our body language. The counseling room, we use it. We call it halo data. What kind of halo data is going on? Because they're talking... You have a couple there, and if they're sitting there, and the wife usually is very expressive and talking, and the husband's sitting there like this. Well, he's communicating something. Now, you can only go so far with that kind of data. That's why somebody needs to speak, because sometimes you can misunderstand that data, too. So you can't just go on that. But we've all experienced that. Now, ladies, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit, because this usually happens in the marriage relationship, Right? When the husband asks, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, really. No, she said nothing, right? Right? It's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we're being honest, okay, well, I'm going to take her at face value. Yeah. Are you sure something is not wrong? So that's just a simple example. So we need to be careful. And the goal, again, is to please God by solving the problem. In fact, sometimes we, maybe there's an issue we need to bring up. Maybe there's a problem we don't know how to approach it. You ever had one of those? We need to address this issue with this person. and I don't want to attack them. I want to attack the problem, but I'm not sure. Let me just quickly give you kind of six questions to think through. These are not rocket science, but th six things to do before you bring up maybe a sticky situation, okay? The first one is this. Do I have the facts right? Do I have the facts right? This is so important. Proverbs 18.13 and 18.17, two of my favorite Proverbs of all time. The first one says, basically, it, it is folly and shame to him who gives an answer before he hears. Think about that. You'll become a fool if you try to give some kind of answer before you actually hear the real issue. Before you hear and understand what's going on, you're usually going to give really bad advice or really, you're not going to deal with the problem. Proverbs 18, 17 says this, One man's case seems right until another man comes along and examines him. Basically, it means there's always two sides to every story. See how practical God's word is? He addresses all these things that we deal with. There's two sides to every story. All right, you've heard one side. What's the other side? 
And so make sure you have all the facts right. And I found in finding more and more, the best way to deal with that is actually to go in asking questions instead of accusing. Instead of accusing them and say, well, I think I have all the facts right, so you, you've been doing this, and all right, ask them questions. Why have you been responding this way? What is it you're thinking? I want to truly understand. The second thing is this. Should love cover this? Meaning, the thing that you want to address, is it a sinful thing? Are they committing a sin? Is there something in their life that's hindering them in their personal growth? Is maybe some biblical command or principle being violated? Or is this just a personal preference or opinion? It's just something that you would prefer they not do, but they're really not doing anything wrong. Mom and Dad, one of the things with the family, I've had, this is hard. It's been hard. I've had to distinguish. Are, are my kids violating God's command or are they violating Dad's command? Now, Granted, sometimes there are things they need to do because dad has said so, mom has said so, and for them to obey God's command, children obey your parents. We looked at that. But sometimes I have to look at my own heart and say, why am I really upset about this? Why can't they do that? Is it just because, well, this is my preference and I don't like that they do that? Or is it, well, are they really doing something that is harming them? Or is it unbiblical? Third thing is this, is my timing right? Is my timing right? A great proverb here is Proverbs 15, 23. Making sure you, it talks about making sure that it is the right time to address a matter. And that takes wisdom is what it does. Number four, is my attitude right? Sometimes we need to do an internal check and look at ourselves and say, why am I actually doing this? Am I trying to help this person, or am I just ticked off about it because of whatever reason? Or is my motive, I really love them, and if they continue in this, it might hurt them. Of course, Ephesians 4, 15, am I speaking the truth in love? And number five goes along with it, are my words loving? Have you thought about that and how, what you're going to say? And Probably the most important one is, have I prayed for God's help in this? Have I actually asked, Lord, this is a hard issue. I think I do need to have come to this conclusion and, and give it some time in prayer. That your heart will be right, your words will be right. That even if they don't respond right, I found that so often. We are looking for some 100% foolproof way to have a conversation with somebody and hopes that they're just going to, you know, they're just going to respond in this glorious way and, oh, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Man, I could just see how much you love me and I will start changing this right now, right? That's what we're longing for. How often does that happen? Well, at least in that way. It does happen, but you're not responsible for their attitudes and actions. You're responsible for your attitudes and actions, whether they're going to respond right or not. You could, I mean, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he ever not speak the truth in love? What did they do with him? Crucified him. So you're in pretty good company, even if you've done it right. Well, the final rule is this. You need to act. Don't react. So much of our conversations, we are just reacting. Instead, we need to act. That's really verse 31 and 32. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So first of all, is our reactions are really at verse 31. Those those are the attitudes and they are the actions we need to put off. They are the reactions of our flesh not getting what we want. And he lists several of them here. We won't take the time to go through each one. 
But I would say verse 31, that is the natural tendency of our Genesis chapter 3 nature. We want to respond in these ways in verse 31. They are automatic responses. We don't have to practice them. You don't have to teach your kids how to be bitter or lash out in anger or slander somebody or have hatred in your heart. You don't have to teach them to do that. They naturally do it. We don't have to practice these reactions. They are automatic. But the flip side is that we need to put on the attitudes that replace those reactions, verse 32. This, instead, it takes practice. It takes prayer. This is not natural. It's supernatural. I'm not naturally going to be kind and helpful and courteous, especially when I feel threatened. I'm not naturally going to be tender-hearted or good-heartedness and compassionate and sympathetic. I'm certainly not naturally going to forgive someone. In fact, in January, we're going to look at forgiveness. We're going to spend about four or five weeks looking at the issue of forgiveness and what God has to say about this. But hear me say this. Conflicts are possible only if a person reacts. That's what gets us in trouble. And again, what communication boils down to is our words. Do our words give grace or do they give grief to the hearer? And words are so vitally important because words have meaning. Words matter to God. And God actually talks a lot in his word about our speech and how we communicate. The question is, why are words so important? Why do they matter so much? Well, in closing, I just want to give you three reasons why words matter. The first one is that words are very powerful. Words are very powerful. Words, even a few of them, can make an incredible difference. I mean, think about this. For example, let me give you a couple examples. Ladies and gentlemen, have you reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. We find the defendant. That next word is going to change everything, isn't it? Guilty. Innocent. They're powerful words. You're sitting in a doctor's office. Your palms are clammy. You're nervous. The tests have come back. The doctor says the tumor is... That next word is going to change everything, isn't it? Benign or malignant. Those words are powerful. And see, here's the thing. The power of speech, the power of words, is actually a gift from God. I mean, everything originated with God, right? He is the creator of what? He is the creator of language. He's the creator of words. And one of the unique things that we are as his creation, we are his special creation because we are made in his image. Therefore, we have the the ability and the power of words given to us. How did he create the whole universe? By what? Speaking. He didn't snap his fingers. He didn't clap. He just said what? Let there be light. And there was light. It's indicate to us words are powerful. They are a gift to us from God. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. James chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, James says that our tongue is like a fire. It can do a world of iniquity or a world of good. Speech is important because speech is powerful, so we need to take care how we speak. The second thing is this, Words matter because they reveal the heart. I wish we had the time to look at these scriptures, but we don't. But Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37, really emphasizes this. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
All these things that you do, they're coming out of your heart. The mouth reveals what the heart conceals. Sometimes we will say things like, well, I didn't mean to say that. Probably that's not actually true most of the time. I didn't mean to say it in the way I said it to you at that moment, but that's what I was actually thinking. It reveals the heart. And Scripture places a significant emphasis on our hearts. The heart is the central focus of who we are. It is what is wrong with us as a people. It's what needs to be changed in us. Think, what is the problem in the world? It's the heart. It's our sinful nature. That's why we need the hope of the gospel. The only thing that can actually change me is the gospel. And so when the word of God speaks about our hearts, it's speaking really about our motivations. It's speaking about, if you would, the control center, the very core of who we are. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is desperately sick who can understand it. That's the key to human behavior right there, that verse. Why do people do what they do? Because the heart is sick. That's why. Proverbs 4.23 then says to us, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs or the issues of life. Guard your heart, he says, because guess what? That's where everything is going to come out of. You know, the issues you have, it's come from outside. We constantly want to think it's everything out there. God says, no, it's what's going on in here. And the third thing is this. Words can bring glory to Jesus Christ. Words matter because they can bring glory to Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 talks about that our words and our deeds to bring glory to Jesus' name. Communication should be one of the clearest areas of difference between the unbeliever and the believer. What characterizes our speech as believers should look different than the world's speech. And I would say not just how we talk, but also what we talk about. So much emphasis is placed on how we talk. Well, you know, we know as Christians we shouldn't use certain words. You know, those are bad words. We shouldn't use those swear words. We shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. We shouldn't do those as how we talk. And that is true because words have meaning, but also the focus of our communication is important as well. What is the topic of our conversation? What do we actually talk about with one another? What characterizes our speech? What's our subject matter, if you would? The way we speak is to be measurably different than those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Well, this has all been practical, but let's finish up here and make this a little bit more practical. I want you to remember this. Replacing habits is not easy, but it can be done. God's command assumes God's enablement. Let me say that one more time. God's command assumes God's enablement. If he's told you you are to do this, he's going to enable you to do it. He's not going to put this before you and say, well, I want you to do this, Christian, and then <laughs> good luck with that. <clears throat> no, that's not God. And no matter how irresponsible the other person is, you must choose to act biblically. You cannot change the other person, but you can change how you respond. You are responsible for your attitudes and your actions. And let me encourage you this, to look at these four rules and say, what rule do I need to work on the most? Because probably one of these four sticks out, that I, I violate this rule a lot. I'm not honest, or I don't keep current, or I, do, I often attack the person instead of attacking the problem, or I'm always reacting to situations instead of acting. 
In fact, I'm going to help you out even more. All you, all you that did notes, you're going to be mad. Because I got this for you right here. Ray, could you help me? Ed, Ed, could you help me? It's about 25 copies if you want. This is basically all the rules and some of the information that you have had the last two weeks. Because I hope that this becomes part of our life. I, I don't want this to be, well, that was a nice message, Pastor. For us, this has become part of what we have done in our home. Just, okay, what rule are we dealing with right now? Because it should become who we are. So, be honest. Keep current. Attack the problem, not the person. Act, don't react. Oh, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth that we have been presented today. Lord, it's been very practical. I'm sure that it, at some point every one of us have said, you know, I'm guilty of that. Or, Lord, you, you know I need to change that in me. Or, or we just think about the whole nature of words. And we think about those who, Lord, have been good examples Men and women who follow you, who they have, been, they have been givers of grace with their speech. They have built us up. They have edified us. So Lord, we thank you for them in our church, in our lives. Lord, let us, be, uh, let us emulate them. Let us uh, use them as our example to say, that, Lord, that's what I want to be. I want to learn how to speak like you. So, Father... We know that all this is because of our hearts, and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that the, we have hope. The hope is we can change. We don't have to remain the same. And so, Lord, we give you praise for that hope in Jesus Christ, that he has broken the power of sin in our life, and that we can now say yes to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.